Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to be talking about rocket science. More specifically, we'll discuss what we use rockets for and how rockets work. Oh, oh, I know! Rockets work by being all like... And then there's all the fire and smoke and stuff, and then it's like boom and... And then it's like, we have liftoff, and I'm all like, whoa, yeah! In Crash's own special little way, he's kind of right. You're probably picturing a space rocket filled with astronauts destined for the moon though, when in actuality there are heaps of different types of rockets. Yeah, rockets are used to launch stuff into space, but we also have missiles for warfare, fireworks for entertainment, and ejection seats for safety. Not to mention the many rockets you might have gotten to play with in school for fun. Model rockets, bottle rockets, even those little film canisters you fill with vinegar and baking soda. Well, I, uh, I just realized how outdated film canisters are. I'm so old. Not me. I'm as young as the day I was born. That literally made no sense. And plus, we're the same age. Maybe physically, but mentally, there's a huge difference. Well, we can certainly agree on that. Point is, rockets are for more than just space exploration, even if those are the most impressive ones. In fact, rockets go all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Oh, come on! Is there anything the Greeks didn't invent? Well, in fairness, what the Greeks invented wouldn't really look like a rocket to us. A rocket, in the broadest terms, is a projectile that propels itself by ejecting its contents. Now, back in ancient Greece, around 400 BC, this guy called Archytas created a wooden bird that ejected steam from its backside to fly along a wire. The wooden bird didn't really have a lot of use, it was just to entertain people. Just like me! It's actually dangerous how self-aware you are. It wasn't until sometime in the first millennium AD that the Chinese started to use more conventional rockets. Theory goes that they used an early form of gunpowder in bamboo tubes to make explosions for their festivals. When a couple of these took off, they realised the launching potential of these tubes and started adapting them to fly longer distances. By 1232 AD, we know for sure that the Chinese had developed prototypical rockets, described as flaming arrows, which they launched at Mongol invaders. These would have also been the earliest form of missile. Needless to say that rockets captivated people across Eurasia, and their interest in the topic grew massively. While they were certainly used for war, their main use was as fireworks for celebration and festivities. Oh yeah, I totally forgot about those little firework rockets! They're all like, boom, fizz! And everyone's like, wow, amazing! Crash, get out of the way! Ah! This one guy who was even more obsessed with rockets than Crash was a Chinese public official called Wan Hu. The story goes that around 1500 AD, Wan Hu wanted to reach the stars, and he chose rocket power as his preferred method of transport. He strapped 47 huge rockets to a chair, readied himself for flight, and lit the fuses. After a huge explosion, Wan Hu and the chair were nowhere to be seen. Wow. He really did it? No crash. He almost definitely exploded in such a huge fireball that there was no trace of him or the chair left. But the point stands that Wan Hu was the first guy to think of using rockets for space travel. In the 17th century, people finally started taking a scientific approach to rockets instead of just blowing stuff up for fun. We won't go into all the little discoveries here, but suffice to say that people from all around the globe were now trying to get rockets to fly as fast and as high as possible. And of course, it was all in the name of peace. Wow, how beautiful. Of course I'm kidding, it was all in an effort to blow each other up. Cause you know, humans. In World War II, the Germans invented the V-2 rocket, which was capable of reaching London and reaping mass destruction. Luckily, the war was almost already resolved before these rockets were put into flight. But of course, America and the Soviet Union were keen to sweep up the German rocket scientists and build their own weapons. This begun the space race, each country trading achievements back and forth. The Soviet Union launched the first satellite, Sputnik 1, and the USA landed the first man on the moon. Of course, nowadays we have over 2,000 satellites in orbit, which we rely upon for GPS, the internet, and to study Earth's atmosphere. And all of this was only possible thanks to the power of rockets. Once again proving that war only leads to good things. Oh well, yeah, apart from the deaths of millions. I said only good things. Jeez. For all the developments we've had in rocket science, the fundamental idea of rockets has always been incredibly simple. Maximize thrust while minimizing weight. Unfortunately, the two ideas are often directly opposed. Thrust is the propulsive force generated by an engine. In the case of a rocket engine, that means the force of all the gases being ejected out the back of it. Now most people think that a rocket propels itself forward by pushing against the air behind it like a jet engine. But this isn't true. A rocket engine works on a very different principle, Newton's third law of motion. 
Newton's third law of motion is often simplified as, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. When you jump off the ground, what's really happening is that you're applying a force to the ground beneath your feet. The ground then applies an equal and opposite force to your body, propelling you up into the air. I know that may sound weird, but it's true. Another way to get the idea is to imagine yourself on a skateboard holding a bowling ball. If you throw the bowling ball off, your skateboard will travel in the opposite direction you threw the bowling ball in. You'll also get the crap beaten out of you by the local skater kids. I learned that the hard way. Using Newton's third law of motion is essential for a rocket, because in space, you have no air to push against. So instead, you eject hot gases out the bottom of your rocket. And those gases make an equal and opposite force that pushes the rocket forward without the need for air. Beautiful. Unfortunately though, that's not the end of the story. If we don't have any air, we can't burn fuel to generate these hot gases. If you didn't know, fuels like wood or petrol need air to combust, because combustion reactions rely on oxygen to work. So if you can't get your air from outside, like in space, then that means you'll need to carry the oxygen with you somehow. Do all the astronauts just take like a really deep breath before they get into the rocket and then exhale into the engine to make it blast off? <gasps> Dragons. That would be insane, but no. There are a couple of ways rocket scientists have gotten around this problem. One way is the solid fuel propulsion system, which uses grains of fuel and oxidizer. We won't go into the chemistry here, but all you need to know is that an oxidizer acts like oxygen and allows for combustion. Solid fuel systems aren't great though, because we can't control the reaction. Once you light the fuel, it's going to combust, whether you want it to or not, all at once. Solid fuel propulsion is only really used for missiles and boosters because they're reliable and relatively cheap. Just like my 1998 Holden Commodore. She ain't pretty, the aircon is broken, and she's got the mileage of a bicycle with two flats, but you better believe she can roll down a hill like nobody's business when I take the handbrake off. I'm pretty certain you don't even have your license. And yet, I own a car. It's a crazy world we live in, culture. Right. The second type of propulsion system is the liquid fuel propulsion system. In this system, you have two tanks. One holds the fuel, and the other holds the oxidizer. If you have the right chemicals, then when the two mix, they'll instantly combust and generate that much-needed thrust. I've got your much-needed thrust right here! Really, man? Come on, we're better than that. The beautiful thing about liquid fuel propulsion is that you can control how fast the reaction is happening by controlling the flow rate of the different liquids. That means a nice controlled thrust. <gasps> No crash. Liquid fuel also turns out to be much more efficient than solid fuel, getting more bang for your buck. Or, if you prefer, more boom for your volume. All large-scale rockets use liquid fuel propulsion systems on their main rocket. There's a huge amount that goes into making a rocket's propulsion system as efficient as possible, but at the end of the day, it's all about trying to reduce the amount of fuel you're carrying. After all, every extra ton of fuel is more weight on your rocket and that just makes it harder to launch. One method for reducing weight that's kind of brilliant is called staging. Staging means dropping off parts of the rocket as they're no longer needed during a launch. The Saturn V rocket that got us to the moon in 1969 had three stages. Each stage has its own engines and fuel tanks, and as each one is expended, they get dropped off the rocket to decrease weight. The next stage then activates with weaker engines that can work now that the rocket is out of the thickest part of our atmosphere. This process repeats until just the most essential parts of the rocket are left. What if everything dropped off and as the final shell comes off, it's just one who, in a chair with 76 rockets strapped to it in space like, I finally made it, baby! Okay, I'll admit, that would be pretty awesome. Usually what's left though are the other components of the rocket. A space rocket typically has four parts. The propulsion system, the guidance system, the payload, and the vehicle. We've already gone over the propulsion system, which takes up the bulk of the rocket's space, but let's look at the other three. The guidance system is a mass of computers and sensors, which help astronauts inside the rocket and people on the ground to tell where the rocket is, what direction it's traveling in, and so on. Without the guidance system, the vastness of space is an incredibly dangerous realm to traverse. It'd be like taking Crash out of the house without his collar on. Mom and Dad stopped doing that when I was 12. I remember specifically because they took me out for ice cream to celebrate taking the collar off, and I started jumping on people's tables and scarfing down their Sunday. The payload is the item the rocket is designed to launch. It could be a satellite, an experiment, a bomb, in the case of a missile, or even people if it's a manned mission. Despite the awe-inspiring spectacle of the rocket, the payload is what it's really about. How do we get this object where we need it to be? Finally, we have the vehicle 
which is essentially the shell which the other three components are kept in for protection and aerodynamic purposes. With vehicle, payload, guidance system, and propulsion system together, the rocket is able to reach into space. I wonder how hard I would have to fart to launch myself into space. Like, it requires all that gas and heat to launch a huge hunk of metal up there. How much cheese have I got to eat? And how would I get back down? There's gotta be another way! To answer all of those questions will take a lot more time. Maybe we'll continue our rocket science discussion in the next episode. Double rocket action! That's hot! See you all soon.